Ladies and gentlemen, open banking pioneers, thank you for joining us and a very warm welcome to our campfire. Here today, we are, I've got an experts, uh, we've got a panel of experts even, to talk about lending and how open banking data enhances the current process, and in doing so creates a fairer and more inclusive society, whilst of course mitigating risk. Now, before we do, I want you to take us back in time Many of us have credit, um, and for us to have a look about where, where it really came from. So credit is almost as old as human civilization itself. We know that money lenders operated more than 5,000 years ago um, in ancient Sumeria. And we know that farmers took out loans and paid them back using commodities such as barley and silver. And gradually we saw the introduction of protection for borrowers such as rules set in the Babylonian Code of Himabari, where the world's first financial regulator capped interest at 33% and decreed that a debtor could, uh, and in quotes, wash his, debt in, wash his debt tablet in water to literally wipe the slate clean um, after storms had prostrated the grains. Now, that's where many of our current terms come from, and I find that absolutely fascinating. Now, clearly, much has changed since then. Thank goodness, borrowers are no longer sold into slavery uh, if they couldn't pay their debts. Yet the financial institutions of old operated in very similar and familiar ways today. When deciding whether to issue a loan or not, ancient lenders would ask around and they found out if the merchant had any bad debts and tried to discover whether um, they had successfully repaid those loans in the past. Now, the questions we ask have become, sure, more sophisticated since then, but the model is essentially the same and is a little outdated, as you might expect. Credit checks no longer work for many types of people, such as the self-employed, gig economy workers, financially excluded segments of the population, and even people with impeccable financial records um, or that have chosen never to take out credit, they have thin files as a result. So open banking will and can change all of that. Allowing borrowers to share financial information securely, granting lenders the ability to make decisions based on real-time access of affordability, not historical performance. And that's the thing, real-time access. Now, that's got to make sense, yeah? It, it makes lending faster, it makes it fairer, it makes it less risky for both the customers and the financial institutions. So that's a win-win situation. We are seeing more and more lenders using open banking to inform their decision-making and prevent a rise in defaults. The adoption rate will continue to increase going forward. Our Global Open Finance Index found that almost one third of those I've surveyed expected open banking to change credit worthiness assessment processes in their countries within a year. And we surveyed over 23 countries. And just under one fifth of the pioneers we surveyed reported that income and affordability testing was an open banking use case that has achieved widespread adoption and is likely to continue to do so in the future. So it's worth really getting under the bonnet of what makes this, this use case tick. Now, the need for better approach to assessment of creditworthiness is becoming ever clearer as the cost of living crisis continues to bite. Now, I just wanted to throw a few stats into the mix here. In the UK, the total value of loans taken out by households and businesses combined is expected to increase by 1.2% this year, a net increase of 29 billion. Figures from the Bank of England show that credit card borrowing hit record levels at the beginning of the year. It jumped by 1.5 billion in February to 50.59, sorry, 0.5 billion, the highest since records began in 83. <clears throat> Now, there is a huge prize here for fair, transparent access to credit for borrowers and access to huge new markets for lenders. Now, here to help us work through how we get there with our panel of industry experts 
Um, it's hosted today by Douglas McKenzie. He's the uh, content editor from FS News. Now, for those of you that were with us at Money 2020, you may recognize him from the barber shop. So, Douglas, over to you to cut a sharp talking conversation. You see what I did there? Douglas. <laughs> That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Helen, for the introduction. And yeah, that was a razor sharp intro into lending, which, as you can tell, as, as Helen detailed, has been going on for a millennia. And we're only just starting to see the change. And, and I'm really excited to have this panel here that can actually take me through that and, and hopefully you as well. So with that in mind, we're looking to be looking at the data on open banking lending risk models and the adoption and ultimately seeing how that's going to come about and joining me i have a panel of guests who are just absolutely right at the thick of it we've got joanne owens the partner at Eversheds sutherland we've got emma steely the ceo at freedom finance we've got daniel jenkinson from consumer and sme lead at open banking limited and before we open it up to the panel we actually have a wee fireside chat with chris corbett the product lead over at Plaid. So I just want to introduce Chris. Thank you so much for, for joining. How are you? Hey, Dirk, not too bad. Good Absolutely to amazing. Now, Chris, I think we should start off at the beginning, okay? What can open banking data actually offer to the lenders that maybe previously they couldn't get from traditional sources? Because if the lenders aren't going to get excited by the innovations, it's not going to happen, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to start with what we have today in the world and in the UK we obviously have a very sophisticated uh, credit reference agency market um, one of the more mature ones in that scenario and that data and the information that you can get from those agencies to as Helen set it up is very important understanding details around someone's historical financial relationships across whether they've got mortgages their utility bills personal loans credit cards their full payment history um, against all of those products, the lines of credits that they have out against them and the utilization against it. Yeah. All of that information is super useful for a lender and we suspect it will always be in terms of um, understanding a, a customer and a potential borrower. But really that just gives you, if you think about yourself as an individual, if someone described you in that way, you wouldn't say that's a great picture of yourself. So we really <laughs> see uh, that as a bit of a sketch outline, if you like, of, of people. It's a bit fuzzy. It's a bit murky. You kind of get a sense for who someone is, but it's not really a, a true picture. And, and it, that boils down to sort of three key areas um, from Platt's perspective on this. The first is a consistency. We'll talk a little bit in the panel around the FCA, um, and they've been looking into, the, obviously, the CRA market. Consistency is a big issue even where we've got this maturity and the three big um cras in in the uk for example the number if you look at the number of defaults in the last 12 months uh, across the three actually only around 20 percent of of those defaults line up across the three bureaus so there's a oh, massive wow. level of inconsistency across them um that also stands across even the number of active accounts which sits around that 40 percent mark so mm -hmm. even for things that you would suspect and expect to be consistent and just accurate and there isn't necessarily the case um the second one we talk about is immediacy this is an obvious one but operating on a monthly batch in today's world for any product coming at it from a product perspective isn't really good enough um, and that creates that lagging indicator and risk to consumers and businesses at the end of the day um, because they may be loan stacking and things like this which ultimately can get them into difficulty and isn't in their best interest. Yeah. And then finally, I'd say around accuracy and blind spots. Um, if we think about here, using the haircut analogy, if we if we use that. <laughs> Please. Straight, <you> can, <laughs> from the front, it looks great. My hair's excellent at the back. Maybe it's gone a little bit too sharp, a little bit too deep. <laughs> you don't quite get visibility of that. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to go anywhere with me um with that kind of a, a look to myself but actually um that's data that you don't see that's information that you wouldn't know just by uh, that sort of sketch outline and so banking data gives you a much more holistic picture a really true photograph of someone from all angles that you can then use in decisioning and affordability and much much more um and that's what's exciting because it's more consistent more accurate in real time um and just gives you a different perspective I mean, those three pillars are going to be so important going forward uh, for the lenders. But also you could already get from some of your answers the feeling that this is going to revolutionize just the way that normal people day to day can also get access 
to credit and you know so could I explore that you know I always love getting these kind of human stories at the end you know what do these new data sources mean for the the everyday applier for, for credit how is it going to change the way that we can get access to it I think this is an interesting I'll see from a lending perspective lending is a balancing act it's a balance of risk at the end of the day that is important both for the lender themselves who are trying to manage the credit risk um, fulfill their obligations around affordability, et cetera, and manage the consumer duty as well now on that side of things. And then there's a risk on the consumer side, obviously, um, as well, and making sure that they are able to manage the repayments and everything else that goes around it. So I think for us around open banking, there's 20 million people in the UK are underserved from a financial services perspective. Today, wow. we're talking in lending as well. The obvious examples around thin file, again, shouldn't really exist and don't need to exist um, with open banking and some of the access to data that we've got. So just because someone hasn't had credit products um, in the past doesn't mean that they should be penalized or let's say they've had a life event, they may have been divorced and all the bills are in someone else's name, but they've got lots of cash in the bank that they could, they could access. And yet they may be prevented from accessing um, financial service products. Same goes for anyone new to country, um, or younger segments in particular, where there's around 5 million people who are who are underserved. So all of these segments of society um, at the moment we see as like prime candidates, and that's where a lot of lenders are focused so far on those edge cases. Yeah. But absolutely, ultimately, everyone has this view, because believe it or not, on prime of surprising behavior there both in both ways. And just because you get access to a product today doesn't necessarily mean it's the right product for you. And so can you really fulfill consumer duty without looking at this data and getting a few, a really true picture of someone? Because you may be able to offer them a higher line, which may enable them to do certain things or better pricing. Um, and all these sorts of things boil down to improving competition and at the end of the day, improving the products that people are able to use. Yeah, and it's that availability that's so critical because, I mean, what divorce has existed in the UK for nearly 500 years. And to find out that people who've been divorced have been in that situation and we're only just addressing it in 2023 is absolutely mental. Um, but I'm intrigued to think that we're at that point where, OK, we are now getting access to these new data sources. We are now looking at alternative ways to, to judge a person's credit score. But what's the actual process of onboarding someone using this open banking data? You know, it's not just, oh, you've got to come to the bank and provide your, your driver's license and, and you know, that kind of traditional element. What's the actual process now? So with open banking, one of the really exciting parts to it is that because it was regulated activity, obviously the banks had to open up access to their um, financial accounts and the payment accounts through PSD2. Um, what is exciting about that is that actually privacy and control have been baked in and always considered from the beginning, which is a very important part of the whole process. So the importance of a great UX um, is obviously a key part of that. And just because of the regulation doesn't mean that you're naturally going to get to that point. Yeah. Um, what we see around lending is actually very high uptake and we have around 85% conversion through the flow uh, where someone is coming through that, but that's down to a lot of blood, sweat and tears in constantly experimenting on that and doing it for specific use cases yeah. and changing that depending on the use case um, and making sure that privacy is front of mind for customers. And we find that that actually creates very positive um, outcomes for them. From the actual open banking process, um, relatively simple in the UK, um, thanks to some of the work that we've got Daniel on the panel later in terms of the OBIE and some of the um, general pack, um, groups that we've had in the industry bodies, which have really driven a high standard in the UK and with PSD3 and other uh, regulatory initiatives going on, that will only go in one direction and improve. Um, but once a customer has selected their bank, they come through, they would give consent, they get to see all of the um, privacy elements to that, the data they'll be sharing, agree to that, select the bank, redirect to a bank, authenticate um, in the UK, generally by biometrics, which is fantastic, and then return and um, know that the data has been successfully shared or know that their account has been successfully connected. And so that streamlined journey helps people to, to adopt the services and particularly in lending as well, where you may have paid a significant amount for a cost of acquisition. The last thing you want is a poor journey, which means the user then drops out um, and that that potential borrower or potential applicant is lost and also is obviously an 
terrible experience for for anyone that's been through one of those yeah. bad journeys. Well, because word of mouth is so critical, especially when it comes to fintechs. It's it's really how so much news gets passed around. To have that bad experience on from the consumer side is you know, you'll go the way of the dodo. But I mean, with that in mind you've kind of highlighted one challenge, but I want to explore a bit further because we've talked about these brilliant opportunities that can, you know, for lenders and consumers of, of credit, but what are the challenges that, that come with this? You've, you've, you've mentioned privacy, but there's got to be operational ones around that too, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think the UX is obviously super important from that side. So having a reliable partner, someone with, um, extensive and best in class coverage and is working specifically for lending as well yeah. is very important even not having support for one bank that means nobody who uses that bank can go through your flow and so that's really really important and is often um, forgotten on that side the other part to it is that actually it's obviously your onboarding journeys and things like this are not just about open banking that is not the outcome that's not the magical moment that the um, customer is looking to get to and so before open banking, it's really important how that's teed up and you have things like IDV, PEPs and sanctions, user inputted data that you need to be um, working through the open banking aspect to help um, add to the bureau checks that you may be doing and then any other aspects to that. So we generally look at it very much at an end to end, but that is part of the challenge as well is making sure that you are looking at your user experience from the first moment a customer is landing with you to the moment where ultimately a loan is dispersed or that's the magical moment that they're looking for. Um, I know we talk a little bit more on the back end side of things as well, but what we've seen is a challenge for some more of the traditional lenders is how do you retrofit open banking into your traditional credit policies? So obviously these are sacred elements to it, to you as a, as a lender. Those rules have been baked in over time and added to over time in many cases. Open banking is a newer thing. How do you weave that in and maintain the risk tolerances that you have and everything else that is already set up is, is a challenge that we've, we've seen um, and why we've also seen the neo lenders move very, very quickly in, in the previous years and be sure. the ones to adopt the most because it's easier for them to a bit more that. granular and exactly fascinating well chris i think that actually leads us perfectly um to invite the others around the fireside since we are at a campfire and uh i'm gonna kind of reintroduce everyone by name again we're just gonna briefly go around it just so people can remember we've had some brilliant user questions come to us as well which we'll be answering at the end but um first up as i mentioned we've got joanne owens who's a partner at Eversheds sutherland uh, joanne thank you so much for, for joining us uh, at the campfire. How are you? I'm very well, Doc. How are you? Very well, indeed. Very well. Thank you so much. And also we've got Emma Steely, the CEO at Freedom Finance. Emma, thank you so much for joining as well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me here today. It's such a pleasure. And last but not least, we have Daniel Jenkinson, the consumer and SME lead at Open Banking Limited. I'm actually going to go straight to, um, I believe, Joanne, because I'm, I'm intrigued to find out um, how the credit information market study examined how new data sources can be integrated into the mainstream credit market. And I would be intrigued to find out like, what role does open banking actually play in that? Thanks, Doug. I think, I mean, the credit information market study was a huge piece of work that, that was undertaken to really understand how the credit information market's working today. And I guess the purpose really is to ascertain how we build uh, an effective credit market, credit information market for the future. And, and, Within the report, the FCA has recognised the value and the importance of open banking and has explored current use of op open banking. And I think there's a, there is a real recognition that, and you know, Chris has already talked to this, that, that open banking can provide alternative sources of data that you couldn't otherwise get elsewhere to either fill in gaps or to give you a better picture of what an individual customer looks like. And I mean, the benefits of that that are huge. So not only can lenders have perhaps more confidence when dealing with particular consumers that they're making the right lending decision for yeah. that customer, but also there's a huge piece around financial inclusion here and enabling customers who today, because perhaps they've got really thin credit files or are looking for a more bespoke credit product, wouldn't otherwise have access to credit. So, so there's a real recognition that I think open banking has a real place um, to play in a, in a credit market of the future. I think the challenge is going to be 
increasing the use of it and how we use it and um, I guess bringing everyone along for the journey Chris Chris already mentioned you know some lenders who've got very traditional models already you know how, how do they make that move um, how do they, how do they integrate this type of data and use it effectively how can they be sure that they can trust it to reach the right lending decision and I think similarly on the consumer side there's a piece to play about bringing the consumer along um, for that journey and um, I guess educating the the consumer on the benefit of and of open banking in terms of the power that they have to be able yeah. to use their data in a way that's beneficial for them. Absolutely amazing. And um, if I could come to uh, Emma as well, I know from your experience in, in the industry as well, you've been looking at um, utilizing different forms of data when it's really been quite quite difficult to access. So, I mean, do you have anything to add to, to what um, Joanne was saying as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from my perspective, you know, open banking has kind of been around forever, right? It just used to be sent in via a fax machine. So, <laughs> you know, it's just a, a change. And so traditionally, we have always used bank transaction data to underwrite. It's just moving now into the digital age. And so for me, it's absolutely critical in the mainstream credit market. And I think from, you know, historically being on the side of being an AISP and you know working with the credit bureaus, you know, all of the credit bureaus now are engaged and have open banking offerings that, that they want to use to drive that financial inclusion. But actually now being on the other side of it at Freedom and working with our panel of lenders, what we're actually really seeing is it's really a handful of lenders today that are actually using that data to be able to say yes and drive that inclusion. And the ones that do, oh, they do it, they do it incredibly well. But actually, the majority of lenders today are still using the data to say no. So therefore, instead of driving the financial inclusion, they're actually driving financial exclusion. Oh, and frustrating. Are, well, frustrating for the um, consumer, yes, but kind of understandable to a certain extent, because what the lenders need is they need confidence to be able to, you know, from a conduct risk perspective, that yeah. actually it is okay to say yes to this customer. And, you know, as much as I sit here and go, oh my goodness, open banking has been, you know, live since the fax machine and prior to that. And, you know, it's been live in the market now for over five years. And we've been saying the same things for five years. Actually, it takes time to learn to use this data. And then you do have to adjust your policies as an organization as well and get comfortable that actually you can lend to more people without necessarily adjusting your risk appetite. And that's that's been a big challenge in the market and something that as an industry, we all need to come together to solve. Uh, I completely agree. It is going to be a complete community and ecosystem-wide change to, to really enact uh, change for good. But um, to your point, Emma, you, you mentioned how it's only a certain amount of lenders that are that are really uh, utilizing open banking right now. And there was actually an audience question that asked a similar similar vein question. So I'm going to come to Daniel and and let you kind of say hi to everyone. No, I, I don't have perfect data, but I've got some interesting insights. And I, I agree that adoption of open banking by lenders is still quite patchy. Where it's used, it does seem to be delivering you know, quite extraordinary value. There's one study that found that 70% of community lenders are using open banking data. So these will be smaller lenders targeting more marginal communities. So 70% is, is very significant. But I think anecdotally, when you move more into mainstream lending, it's used much less or not at all. For example, it might be used if a loan goes to referral. So if you can't say yes or no on the initial application, it may go to a separate unit and they may use open banking data to, to use on that decision. But I think, you know, even, not, even withstanding that, we see around 20% of our live to market TPPs are active in the credit space. So that, you know, the open banking ecosystem is very broad. It covers all kinds of different propositions. But just about just slightly under 20 percent of all the TPPs live to market today are working in the credit space. So it's clearly a very vibrant and active sector um, and it's clearly working for those lenders that are using it. Now that that will be key. You know, we, I'm starting to, to actually get a real feel for that. It's you know it's not this magic bullet. You actually have to kind of uh, look at how the use cases 
how it can impact your risk, um, and then some of the brilliant kind of use cases that that we heard from from Chris earlier as well can can really come to fruition. Um, but I'm going to um, be the bad guy and, and stay on these kind of potential challenges um, for for a bit longer. Um, and maybe Emma, you can kind of um, speak to this again. Um, and that's really kind of looking at the potential challenges around consumer consent now that we're entering this entirely different kind of uh, data as, a, as an almost, I think the overused term is an oil at this point. Um, so do customers actually really understand what they're agreeing to, to this end? Um, I don't see how a customer can't understand because you know, open banking came out in the same year as GDPR. So it's all very much built on those principles and it has explicit consent. Um, you know, so the consumer can see quite clearly, you know, every AISP has to display, you know, what the data is being used for, how much data is being used and for what purpose, and that consumer consents to doing so. And, you know, just as Chris was talking about earlier about seeing 85% throughput, when I was account score you know, at Equifax, you know, I were, you know, we saw exactly the same, um, you know, we were seeing, you know, 80 to 85% of customers going through the journey for the, for the customer. They don't need to know, you know, that, oh, this is open banking. They need to understand what that value exchange is. And it needs to be actually about, you know, if they are, uh, for example, a marginal decline or they have a thin file customer, yeah. you know, actually, if they are to share their data, then they may get something that otherwise they won't, wouldn't have gone before. And that could either be a credit approval or an improved interest rate. And some of the lenders are moving now or have already moved to giving reduced um, interest rates based on having access and being able to monitor and understand the data. It's important that they continue with the recurring access to understand that customer circumstances and be agile as lenders and adjust, uh, adjust accordingly to what they're seeing in the customer um, once they have lent to the customer as well. Fascinating. So it, it's not really just kind of one stamp. You've opened up your your open banking data, and, and it's actually going to progress. And I imagine as the the data becomes richer, that's also going to be changing. It has to be at this dialogue. And Chris, I'm going to come back to you uh, once more and and see if you've got anything that you can that you've seen in this regard when it comes to to privacy and and also the consent as it evolves. Yeah, and I think Emma, Emma touched on a really interesting point that has long been talked about um, around this sort of continual monitoring um, to achieve good outcomes. And I think that's often where consumers can end up in a challenging place if they're often we talk about life events, sudden um, things that may happen, income shocks. We're in I work in the tech industry. A lot of people in my industry have had um, income shocks recently um, and that kind of thing at the moment really isn't captured by a lot of lenders. Underwriting is seen as a snapshot uh, done at the point where um, you're distributing your loan, however product that may be. Um, but we are seeing much, much more interest in that ongoing monitoring side of things. Um, and that helps just to make sure that everything is going along as you'd expect for customers and to show early warning signs for customers if their income has suddenly dropped off. Um, and that's one of the areas um, where open banking can give a much richer insight into data and the real-time income verification is hugely powerful for people and people that are maybe thin file um, as well are good examples of that. Um, but if you see a sudden drop off from that, then you can reach out to that customer and see what's going on. It might just be that they're in between jobs. They might just be taking a break, but they might be in quite a stressful situation as well. And so these kind of things we're starting to see a lot more interest in, um, and that is both beneficial for consumers and for lenders in that um, if they can prevent that customer going to, into a collections process, then they absolutely want, want to be able to do that. And that's positive for, for both sides. Yeah, that sounds absolutely amazing. I love hearing about how we can use fintech for, for good and actually enabling people that, you know, as we've talked about throughout this whole conversation, thousands of years not had access to it. And now we're starting to see that change. But with that, and when I hear thin file, obviously, you've then got to think of the potential fraud risks around that. And uh, Joanne, if I could come to you and, and ask, what are the, the fraud risks um, around open banking uh, you know, and in the lending space? And can these risks actually just be mitigated? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think risks, I think risks can be mitigated. I think, you know, fundamentally, people are opening up access to data and there's obviously a concern as to who else can get access um, 
to that data, you know, um, if there's hacks or, or whatever, whatever. But I think fundamentally all of this can be mitigated and there already are guardrails and protections in place that have been built in through the historic legislation. I think, and, and, and this links into the previous point that we were just talking about, I think it might be the perception of fraud or the, the fear of fraud that is concerning for certain customers. And, yeah. and I think that that's where you have to bring people along for the ride and you have to educate. If we think about a traditional banking relationship, you know, that was very much a private relationship that people wouldn't share with anyone else. And, you know, I, I think of generations older than me, they certainly wouldn't have spoken to anyone else about money and they certain, certainly would have been reluctant to share their banking information um, with other people. So I think I think there's a real thing here about educating people on the, on the protections that already exist. I think there's some confusion, if I'm honest, if we look at what's going on currently within um, UK financial services and things like APP fraud, you know, what is the message that customers are given to protect themselves from APP fraud? Don't share your bank details with anyone. So th there's contradictory messages, I think, that people receive. And I'm not saying that that's wrong, because obviously those messages serve serve a purpose. But I think it's about balancing that and educating people that actually it's OK to share your data with the right people. Um, but but there is a huge piece for me there around how you bring consumers along for the ride. You you give them the confidence that they've they've got protections and also that I guess that the industry is working together behind the scenes to make sure that the right protections are in place and fundamentally keeping up with the fraudsters who are obviously trying to undermine and take advantage of a lot of this. Yeah, uh, we you obviously noticed, um, you know, especially post 2000, um, when so much of society got moved digital, um, the fraudsters just had a field day. Um, and it, it's fascinating to see that education maybe in, in lending and credit has never been particularly great. Um, and now we're entering this whole new um, ecosystem where we're increasing access to it. But are we increasing the amount of education around it? Um, and now that the fraudsters are moving just as fast, if not faster than a lot of uh, a lot of the, the white hat uh, teams, then suddenly things begin, uh, become a little bit scary. But um, Emma, you, you brought up sending data over by a fax um and obviously that's quite a huge paper trail how does that you know how is that changed um really when it comes to the kind of the fraud risks and and are we actually in a better place i think we're actually in a much stronger place um to be honest and i remember you know going back like back if i go back to 2017 when i submitted my original aisp application for my firm and you know the one thing that the fca came back and questioned before they authorised the first 10 on day one, um, of which I was very thankful to be a part of. You know, the questions that came back to all of us as um, you know, potential AISPs then was all in and around the information security. Um, you know, and I've been in regulated firms for far, well, far longer than I care to mention, really. But, you know, um, the, but the fact is that the FCA was so um, hot on making sure that all the security controls for all of the firms that they authorise um, were in place. And that was something that I found incredibly refreshing um, at the time and continue to do so. And I think all of the um, authorised parties, you know, they can, we all continue to engage with the regulator. You know, the regulator is not neutral on open banking. Um, you know, absolutely at the FCA encourage it. And so it's Im important that we have those parameters and control. But yes, we are in a much more secure space um, and also from a fraudster's perspective, I mean, obviously we're some way into open banking now, but it, if it's a fraudster trying to access uh, credit whilst using um, open banking, it takes time to build up a bank account with real transactions in. Um, and it's a whole lot of effort. So it's a lot more effort for a fraudster to um, look to try and defraud the lenders. Um, via open banking. So I think it's a much uh, safer, secure um, platform to use, certainly than uh, compared to uh, back in the days of the fax. Oh, absolutely brilliant. I love getting this, this uh, shining bit of positivity through to it because so many people can be affected by this um, and in such malicious ways that it's brilliant to hear that actually this is moving in the right direction. 
Um, now, one thing that's certainly moving in quite a steadfast direction is um, the use of artificial intelligence. We're now seeing it in the generative side, um, but obviously there's always been this backbone for maybe you know, the last couple of decades where artificial intelligence and, and automation has been used um, to help accounting and streamline processes. Um, but Daniel, I'd be intrigued to, to get your perspective from the consumer side of things, because now the consumers are fully aware of the power of AI. You know, are there any risks from AI categorization? And you know, I'm intrigued. You know, what what's that going to mean for for lenders or even the consumers at the end of of that in the future? It's in, super interesting question. I think you know, obviously, we've seen that consumers are generally happy to share their data. It's worth just saying, of course, that you know, it's very common to share paper copies of your statement that contains exactly the same data. So, yeah, yeah. in a way. This is not something new, we're just replacing it with something that's not from the 1970s in the idea that you photocopy and send your statements. If you even have a paper copy of your statement, it just seems archaic today. So in that sense, this is nothing new from a, at a simple, very sort of basic level. But obviously, consumers will be aware that this data can be processed and that interesting decisions can be made about them based on it. You know, consumers are not idiots. They know what can be done with big piles of data, and they are handing over very significant data files to, to lenders. It, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I wonder, and I think as the market develops, I see, I don't think it's a contentious view to say that this becomes the norm for all lending. I, I, I think roll this forward two, three years. I don't really see why every time anyone applies for a mortgage or a loan or a credit card, they don't go through an open banking journey. I, I think that's probably the way we're going. Crystal ball time, I know. And I think if that happens, I think there should also be in parallel a conversation about some of the ethics that go along with that, about what is appropriate and what's not appropriate to do with that data. I'm not suggesting any lenders are currently doing anything unethical with the data, but I think there should be a parallel conversation about what is right and what is wrong about things that you can do with that data. I yeah. think that's just an appropriate thing that should happen as we go through market shifts. And you talk about AI. There is talk about trust marks for AI and the way that it's used. I don't see why similarly lenders might not come together. We talked about the industry coming together. It might be that the lending industry wants to come together and develop a trust mark that says, yes, we use your data. We're not ashamed of that. We don't hide that. And these are the these are the five principles that we operate under. We will use it in these ways. We will not do this. We will never sell it on. And I think that would be hugely positive um, to help build that long term trust if consumers are going to move into a world where they're doing this quite regularly, which I suspect they will. be. Yeah, I can imagine. And do you think, uh, Joanne, if I could come to you and, and look at that AI categorization and that use of AI um, data, for instance, do you think customers are, are you know, how long till we get, for instance, do you think there's going to be any kind of le legal risk when it comes to that? Is there going to be any kind of look at, well, the AI used the certain type of technique of AI learning? What's the risk of putting people in different categories of lending via AI? Does it need that more human touch? Do you think there's some kind of uh, maybe legal back and forth to be had on that? Yeah, I mean, I think currently the, the major concern is um, whether, the, whether the decisioning that's being made through AI is non-discriminatory. Um, I think that's the biggest concern um, because obviously the AI is learning from the information that it's that it's given. And if there's any element of bias or discrimination in that information that it's learning from, there's a risk that that can feed through into the, the decisions um, that are later made. And I think that is the biggest concern at the, at the moment that you know customers aren't being profiled and decisions aren't being made about customers in a way that is effectively discriminating um, those customers. So in my mind, there has to be currently a level of in human intervention to make sure that that discrimination isn't taking place. Yeah, I mean, with all these pillars, if we come together, we, you know, we've now talked about um, artificial intelligence, we've talked about beating fraud and actually how we're moving in the right direction. We've talked about how consumers actually don't mind if it's called open banking data, they're just getting a better product from it. So if we tie that all together, Chris, if I could come back to you, um, what, what's the actual impact? What's the bottom line to customers if we get this right? I think um, I completely agree with what I think. Where is the 
this is just into how all lending decisions are made in the future um, and that the best parts of it then are used um, in the right way. And ultimately, uh, lenders are regulated. They've got their credit policies, all these sorts of things. And it needs to be baked into all of that. And it needs to be, to be baked into um, how they manage uh, vulnerable customers, consumer duty, et cetera, as, as I mentioned. So I think that's ultimately where we'd like to, to end up. The result of that um, will be very positive, certainly for um, some of the fringe populations. But as I said, we're, um, we're talking about 20 million people who are underserved in very explicit categories today. Um, in some ways, you could say that everyone is in one way or another, and people don't know what they're missing until they have it. Um, so some explicit examples of that, um, we mentioned like very simply income verification, for example. Um, today, a lot of the ways this is done is estimated and is um, not, not the highest quality and not highly accurate on there. That's obviously very impactful from both sides into that. If you recently had a promotion um, and a pay rise on there, you want to be able to leverage that for whatever it might be. Um, you probably can't right now. You probably have to wait three months or something like that, or even then, um, even longer for that to, to flow through. And that's hoping you're with a bank that leverages um, Cato data, for example. So that's one explicit area. I think more broadly than that, being able to build the understanding of the customer helps protect customers better. If you're just relying on credit bureau information, that presents risk to customers. And as I said, lending is this balancing act. You do need to be aware on, on both sides. Um, and so that's another key area where it just gives you, at the end of the day, it gives you more accurate information. As I said, more accurate, more in instantaneous and more consistent data that will lead to outcomes on both sides of that seesaw, if you like. Um, but actually, at the end of the day, that should lead to uh, beneficial things, given the guardrails that exist today from a regulatory perspective. And the FCA is pretty proactive just generally as well um, in the UK, which is obviously a positive for that as well and um, voicing any concerns that do crop up from a consumer perspective. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. You almost feel like the two sides need an element of empathy while we're going through this change. You know, the lenders want to embrace this change, but realistically, they can't just get to that point immediately. Um, but I'm going to focus on the consumer still um, for a bit longer. And Daniel, I've got to come to the same question with you and get your perspective on this. Yeah, you know, we've heard some brilliant impacts from from Chris there. But how about yourself? Well, I was going to make um a point about consumer duty and I think that's an interesting angle and obviously consumer duty is very new and we don't know how it's going to play out in the, in the UK exactly um, but I think there are some lenders using open banking data and it, it would seem to me anyway just from reading for example you know case write-ups from the financial ombudsman service that those lenders are almost held to a higher level of, of standard because they are aware that their consumers are experiencing financial difficulty. And if they continue to lend, decisions can go against them because they are making decisions. And the ombudsman can say, look, you knew this person had missed their council tax payments over the last three months, and yet you continue to lend to them. Therefore, we don't believe you did meet your obligations, and therefore we're going to find against you. And it almost feels to me that some that lenders are potentially being slightly penalized for using this data. And I actually think that over time it should almost move in the opposite direction. I mean, I'm sure we've all done an affordability assessment. I should possibly be careful what I say, but I'm sure we've all done an affordability assessment. And I think I'd possibly say that perhaps some of the figures were perhaps a little bit not 100% accurate. Um, and lots of people don't know, for example. So, I mean, affordability assessments, I, I would imagine, are frequently very, very inaccurate, but done on open banking, they're not. And it does seem to me that there's a consumer duty angle here for lenders to do everything they can to ensure that the assessments they make when they lend are as accurate and as full as possible. And that therefore, that penalization of using um, open banking data could actually swing the other way. And actually, if you're a lender that doesn't use open banking data, it could almost be a question of, well, why didn't you do this? Because it's so simple and it's so easy. Why did you not get this extra data on your customers to make sure this lending decision was appropriate? And I, that's, a, again, a little bit crystal ballish and we're not there yet. But I think it's potentially quite an interesting angle. It's a really interesting angle, you know, how you can change the narrative to then suddenly see, I mean, I imagine that would uh, light a fire to keep the, the fire analogy going. Um, and you'd suddenly see adoption rates 
hugely change. But before I go into that adoption rate change, I'm just going to ask em Emma's perspective on that as well and, and get some, because I love hearing all these positive use cases, at the, you know, towards the end. And Emma, if I could get your perspective too, before we we find out how to kind of get to those adoption levels that we were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I, yeah, from my perspective, I think adoption of this really for the customers, it transforms uh, the credit market as we see it today. Um, I agree with everything uh, that my fellow panelists have said. And I think you know, if I sit and look at it from Freedom's perspective, you know, we see over 180,000 customers a month looking for credit solutions that come to us via our partners or directly to our site. We've got, we know we've got the broadest panel of lenders in the UK with personal loans, credit cards, homeowner loans, car finance, but up to 30% of those customers will not receive an offer. Now, some of them are just window shopping, so that, that's absolutely fine. Others would not meet lending criteria, and some people may be, it may be due to their circumstances, so completely fair um, you know, and reasonable for the lenders not to lend. But actually, what we do actually see is that up to about 8,000 customers a month we believe have strong credit worthiness and affordability. So when we combine those data sets um, with CRA data, with the behavioral data that we see in the applications, you know, there is a real opportunity there for lenders to be able to open up, but without increasing their risk um, appetite and without changing their policies. So I don't think the uh, industry needs to change massively, um, but it does need to get um, comfortable and embrace with confidence that they can lend to customers with real time data sets. Um, and that can start to deliver some equity in the financial services space. The other point um, I just wanted to quickly make, and maybe it's going back to the AI piece slightly, but we do know, you know, there is absolute data bias in our models uh, and in the, you know, in the Bureau models. And that is not because it's deliberate, it's certainly unconscious bias, but you know, these models were designed at times decades ago, um, primarily by men, um, you know, by white men. And so, you know, you can be, you know, with the open banking and with the additional data sets, there is the, absolutely the opportunity to drive that inclusion when it also comes to um, you know, race and, um, and sex. So, you know, they, for me, are the absolutely wider um, opportunities that we have if we get this right for the customer. Yeah, truly. In fact, I, I saw just a, a couple of days ago, we've only finally got to the point where there are uh, as many women as uh, CEOs and founders as there are Johns. Um, in the world and surely by opening up this floodgate of information um, we're going to realize that you know more than half the population of the world is perfectly suitable on a credit way to to get credit for a business and everything like that so I'm so excited to see the societal impact that all this is going to happen but first we have to get there um, and uh, you know one uh, one viewer actually um, brought in the question is um, which was funnily enough one I was going to end on and Daniel I'm coming to you with this you know could lending be the kind of TFL moment, I, I think they, they put as uh, for open banking, that finally drives full mainstream adoption. What's the cork that's plugging this adoption ring? I saw, uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Could it be the TFL moment? I, it's an interesting one. I, I think it, it could well be, but I would like to bang the drum for some other open banking use cases that I think could also potentially be TFL moments. I mean, I you know, we're talking about credit here. And I, I think at the moment, open banking is held back because it is only payment accounts. And I think we should be looking, and we are obviously working on expanding out to other types of accounts, so that if you're looking to refinance your credit, you can access all those other credit accounts and see what they're like. That needs open finance. And I know it's on the JROC's agenda, but I think that is super, super important. Um, because it, it would actually make PFM work fully because you'll get exposure to all people's accounts. And I think that's a, a huge one. I also would bang the drum for savings as well. You know, obviously, slightly controversial as we've got a lender on the panel, it would be better if consumers didn't need to borrow in the first place, I think, possibly a philosophical debate for another day. But you know, we know there are at least 20% of the UK population that have no savings at all. So when something goes wrong, their boiler breaks down, their van breaks down, they can't get to work, they are forced to go and get credit. And if there were solutions and open banking can power these solutions to help them save more, 
it could be that some people would not be forced into credit because for everyday emergencies. And I, I think those kind of automated savings apps could also be another TFL kind of moment because I think they are a very, very broad applicability to um, a lot of people. Yeah, now that really, I mean, that is a real topic for a whole nother day, but we can kind of segue into it slightly with another audience question that is kind of, I'm intrigued to this kind of moral area and the fact that it seems like a lot of uh, near prime and payday lenders are using this open banking data. They're the ones that have have embraced it. Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, Joanne, could you maybe speak to us a bit more about you know, what does that show us if, if that's the case? I mean, I think, well, number one, sort of those products are considered to be higher risk and, and they're very much on the regulator's radar. So I guess in terms of scrutiny around um, lending decision and the correct correctness of the lending decision, there is definitely more incentive for those higher risk lenders to make sure they're getting those lending decisions right. Um, I think also historically, um, the way that sort of traditional credit is reported and the, and the delay in terms of reporting that you know customers can have very short-term borrowing products that wouldn't necessarily hit their credit file until a month two months after that product's been taken out and so if you're a lender looking to lend to someone there will be data that could be missing um, in terms of that customer's existing um, credit commitments and how they're paying existing credit commitments so there's certainly advantage to being able to have access to real-time banking data that will show the money coming in and going out out of an account um, but I think you know the takeaway for me is probably around the gaps in in the traditional data versus what open banking can give you and plug to make sure that appropriate lending decisions are being are being made yeah it's finding that balance and again that's another theme that i'm really hearing in this conversation is not only is it balance between the lenders to be more proactive and the consumers to be more demanding but also that there's so much conversation to be had around everything and it always seems to be this weighing scale of how much is too much how much is too little are we being a good society if we're doing too much and making it too available and it's a fascinating uh conflict um but chris could i maybe get your perspective as well on this i know platt works with a lot of different types of organizations and and have you seen certain types you know really kind of go for it a bit more yeah i think um what we have seen previously is maybe a reticence from some lenders i think you can get into these conversations and it can sound quite daunting or complex and everything like that i think we've done a lot of work just to simplify the, the whole piece, as I said, the, the user experience, you shouldn't need to worry about that. The privacy side of things, you shouldn't really need to worry about that. And then actually the data itself is an area that we've done a lot of work recently on, but um, to, Emma's done a lot of work on this previously, but that's an area where um, we talked about AI earlier and um, the whole categorization models, and then actually producing consistent insights off the back of that, that are then much more easily fed into decisioning systems. I think that whole piece is very important to keep in mind and that will create a degree of standardization for users and consumers as well. And that breeds familiarity and understanding, which ultimately I think are all, all good things. So that's some stuff that we've been, been working on. And I think that's something to keep in mind from a lender perspective is you don't have to do all these things on your own and try and figure all this out. The industry has matured massively. And so, Previously, we saw more neo lenders, as I said, newer to market, um, focusing on open bank it, banking. Uh, we also have really interesting use cases that aren't actually lenders, but who need to conduct affordability analysis um, for various reasons. We work with a company called Sci uh, Social uh, Lightning Social, sorry, um, and they produce and they distribute grants to people, but they need to know if someone's eligible for a grant. How do you do that? You need to do an affordability analysis. So they're not lenders, but the same. Um, tools that we provide they use and so that's super important to consider and there's several other use cases around that as well uh, and that's where we'll get to and that's what we're starting to see as the open banking has matured there's a degree of solidarity uh, there's it's quite solid now across the banks from that side getting better the journey is solid and clear for people how that's used is then much more easily accessible from a lender perspective and so now we're starting to see more traditional lenders move into the space or at least have a project identify it go through the use case that's most relevant for them um daniel mentioned some of the other areas but it might be vrp might be the best way and they actually start from a repayment side rather than an underwriting side 
um, or they start with so the identity and verification side of things. So there's a whole span of that. But I think um, we're certainly at that point now that we're seeing that difference between early adopters and then the early mass. We're certainly in the early mass stage now. Well, I'm going to pick out that word familiarity that you used in there, because I think that's been so key to a lot of digital success, you know, in any ver industry vertical or any industry is once people become used to it. I know, Joanne, at the beginning of the, the conversation, you were talking about how, um, you know, older generations have been, you know, hammered into them that do not share your financial data. And now it's getting to this conversation of, oh, do share it, but just with the right partner. And if we start seeing those traditional institutions actually move into the space, I am sure that's only going to absolutely uh, increase adoption. But one thing that increases adoption, especially when it comes to fintech here in Europe, has been regulatory oversight. And um, you see here, you know, whenever a regulator um, enacts innovative ideas, we will follow suit, unlike in other geographies. So Emma, could I get your perspective and, and see when it comes to Europe anyway, you know, could or at least should the regulators play a more active role in encouraging open banking amongst lenders? Uh, well, I will always say yes. Um, so right now, <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, there are, you know, there's the consumer driven markets, which the US absolutely is, right? The US, you know, they don't, it's not about bringing in regulation um, in the US. And so it's really that consu US consumer saying, I have the right to share my data and do what I want. You know, in the UK and Australia, Canada, you know, it's been very much about the regulation. Um, and I think the fact is that when the regulator, takes control of it what that starts to enable is that ability to give the consumer to feel in control and feel safe and that is a really important part of it so yeah from my perspective you know I would very much like to see you know the regulator continuing um, to drive this kind of momentum you know, really globally um, you know you start to see where that adoption happens there are some markets that will always just be driven by consumers saying I want to do it this way and uh, being market-led like that but uh, for Europe it, to me it would absolutely be regulatory-led. Perfect I, to be honest I, I should have expected that but also I've now got to to get Daniel's perspective as well. Yeah I, I think I agree and, and obviously you know in terms of regulator-led well, I, I think it could be industry led as well, to a certain extent. I, I think as the market matures, I think the industry could come together um, to communicate the benefits of doing this and to explain why it's safe. And I, I think that could be a very powerful thing and potentially more powerful than the regulators doing that. I think regulators have a key role to play in opening up new data sets. Um, so moving towards open finance, I think is very important. And I do think as well, regulators in terms of the actual rules that govern lending, so the conch rules, I think those don't fully reflect the fact that open banking data is being used now, and I think they could be updated um, and, and incorporate new guidance on the way in which open banking data should be used. So I think there's definitely a role for regulators, but I think there's a role for industry as well to play to push this forward. There goes that balancing theme once again, and we are coming to time, but Joanne, I'm going to come to you to, to kind of uh, probably round it off and, and kind of look at the this kind of balancing act between regulators and, and industry innovation when it comes to lending, please. Um, well, I think it's fair to say, and Emma made this point earlier, that at least from a UK perspective, um, you know, the FCA is very focused on financial inclusion. Um, but that's balanced against financial inclusion, but that still means you've got to make the right the right decision. So yes, it's right that you know, consumers should be included, but you've still got to ultimately re reach the right decision and you've got to do that in a way that protects the consumer. Um, they're always going to do that because regulators are always going to have a consumer protection objective. But I think my take is that the regulators do genuinely see the benefit of um, open banking, um, both for industry and the consumer alike. I think there's a real drive for consumers to have power in their data and to be aware that they have power in their data. And I guess that comes back to what Emma was saying about, you know, the US market where consumers are very much, you know, this is my data and I'm going to decide how I use it. Um, so for me, I, I think there is the protection there. I think that protection is going to evolve as, as the market evolves, but fundamentally um, open banking, open finance is, is clearly supported. Um, and um, there's no reason to see why it wouldn't continue to be, to be that way. 
Absolutely amazing. Well, I just want to say a massive thank you to the Campfire panel. Um, it's been brilliant being taken through that kind of journey, seeing where, where we started, how it contrasts um, from where it started, and really the exciting opportunities in the future, but also the challenges that we need to overcome. And I mean, you're the ones that are going to be uh, leading it. So thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, I've been Doug McKenzie, and I'm going to pass it back to Helen. Thank you so much, everyone. Doug, thank you so much. That was fabulously hosted. It was such a shame to bring that to an end, wasn't it? It really was. I really enjoyed it. It was it was good. I would like to thank all of our panel for sharing their insights in such an in-depth way. Um, for me, there was a couple of key takeaways. I, I love the idea of the TFL moment. Um, you know, thank you to whoever in the audience asked that question. And um, I love the idea about maybe open banking, data, and AI, maybe that's going to be the new holy trinity. But I do think it comes back to what Emma was saying. You know, it's about that value exchange, isn't it, really? So um, a huge thank you to all of our panel. Um, our campfires are now seen in 40 countries over the world, so I would like to th thank everybody um, that is, is tuning in to watch. Um, thank you very, very much. I'd also like to say thank you to the OBE team. They work amazingly hard behind the scenes. So a, a big thank you to them. We will be posting this on social media. Um, so please do share it um, with everybody. And that way we can continue to, um, to grow this amazing um, uh, use case of lending. So all that remains for me to say is, um, Goodbye and take good care. See you next time. Cheers. Bye for now.